You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning. No, this is not the return of King of BPA Bowling. This is Newsmakers. Why a bowling alley? Well, because of this book, Bowling Alone, by Harvard University professor Robert Putnam. You see, over the last 20 years, the number of Americans who bowl has increased significantly. But the number of Americans bowling in leagues, that's declined by almost 60%. Now that's important to bowling alley owners because it means a decline in the amount of sales of beer and snacks. But it's also important to Putnam as a symbol of the decline of American connectedness. Whether through formal groups like PTAs and the Boy Scouts or through informal groups like bowling leagues, Americans aren't connecting with each other the way they once did. Back in October, Professor Putnam was in Cincinnati and I sat down to talk to him about his theme. Here's a part of that conversation. In the 50s and 60s, uh, Americans were very connected with their communities. Uh, levels of church going were at an all time high, so far as we know. Uh, levels of involvement in clubs, Rotary and Kiwanis, and the, you know, the NAACP, and so on. Um, uh, levels of voting were, were high, uh, levels of giving were high, uh, and probably as a fraction of income, levels of philanthropy giving uh, was probably higher than it has ever been in American history. But that was merely the culmination of a, of a probably a century long growth in all of those things. Part of it was that the experience of living through, first of all, the Depression and then World War II and coming out of that, the sense of shared fate, the sense that we actually were actually all in it together uh, and that we could achieve great things collaboratively, connectedly. And now most of those organizations have lost between 25 and 50 percent of their members. And our, um, our uh, relative generosity in terms of giving philanthropy as a fraction of our income has declined by about half. I mean, at the peak in 1965, for every dollar that we spent on all forms of entertainment, Disneyland or television or whatever, Every dollar that we spent on entertainment, we spent 50 cents on, um, on uh, giving to other people. Now, last year, 1999, for every dollar we spent on entertainment, we gave away 25 cents. So that our re in relative terms, our giving, our generosity has been cut in half, and that has followed the same downward trend. And the same thing is true in voting. Voting reaches its peak in the, uh, in the presidential election of 1960, and it's declined by about 25%. What's happened? The first one that everybody comes to everybody's mind first is we're all too busy and two career families and the fact that you know women have moved into the paid labor force and therefore we're all just really much busier and that that is part of the story um, it's however less of the story than most people think and you can see that if you look at the evidence that we analyze in the book bowling alone because the trends down are down among bachelors and they're down among stay-at-home moms. Indeed, the dropout rate from PTAs is actually greater among stay-at-home moms than it is among moms who work outside the home. So what that says to me is, yes, it's true that we're a little busier, especially if we've got two people working outside the home, and that is part of the story, and we, we need to think about that, but it's not the whole story. Um, a second part of the story, and again, when I began doing the research on this, I was surprised to discover this is suburban sprawl and the automobile. It turns out, we discovered when we did the research, that there's a very simple rule of thumb. Every 10 minutes more of additional commuting time cuts every form of social connection by 10%. A third, I have to say, is entertainment uh, television. Um, I always want to, be make clear, want to be careful here to make clear that public affairs broadcasting is actually good for your civic health, but um, entertainment television has come to play a larger and larger role in our leisure time, and frankly, it's lethal to connecting. Uh, the, more we, the more people spend time sitting watching friends, the fewer friends they have. That's the actual fact. So what difference does all this make? This is not a matter of, you know, nostalgia for the 50s or, or warm, cuddly feelings. In measurable ways, 
measurably, our communities don't work as well when people are not involved. Take schools, for example. If you're worried about test scores here in Cincinnati Public Schools, say, you might have one or two strategies for improving the test scores or for cutting dropout rates or, or, or raising SAT scores. You might say, let's spend 10% more in the schools, 10% more, you know, better teachers, more teachers, computers in the classroom, or let's have 10% more parental involvement in the schools, people connecting with their kids' teachers and with their schools and with, their, with other parents. All of the evidence shows it's an easy choice. This, the parental involvement strategy, is more effective. I'm not saying we shouldn't spend money on schools, but I am saying that the, what we label as a schools problem in America is largely not a schools problem. It's a, parent, it's a parent's problem. It's the fact that parents are just not nearly as involved with their kids' education as they once were. And what about in politics? I think it's really fundamentally a disaster for political life that Americans are dropping out of, co of connections. It's um, because, look, uh, 25 or 30 years ago, most American elections were fought, campaigns were fought by people getting involved. Campaigns, campaigning was something we did, not something that was done to us. But as we have moved from what I call social capital, that is these connections, you know, the labor unions and, and clubs and, you know, meetings and back fence conversations and so on. As those have tended to dry up, candidates, in order to reach us, in order to try to impress us, have moved to television, to, to the, they, they move, this is the language of political consultants. They move from an, a ground war to an air war. That's the language they, they use. And air wars are expensive. And so what we've done is to replace individual one-on-one -on -one campaigning, which just means you and me talking about you know, how we, who we think the best candidate would be. We've moved to a really expensive air war, and that's increased the relative importance of financial capital as distinct from social capital. Where do we go from here? There's a historical parallel to this period we're in now. An earlier period, at the turn of the last century, between the 19th and 20th centuries, when, you know, around 1900, when then, too, we'd been through a period of economic change, the Industrial Revolution and urbanization and immigration and so on. As people moved from the farms here into Cincinnati, people left their connections behind, and we had a social capital deficit, too, then. And then we fixed it, or that is, our, our predecessors fixed it. In a very short period of time, at the turn of the last century, most of the major civic institutions in American communities today were invented. The Boy Scouts and the Red Cross and the League of Women Voters and the NAACP and the Urban League and the Knights of Columbus and Hadassah and, uh, you know, the Community Chest, which became United Way, and Community Foundations. Virtually all of these major institutions were invented very, in a very quick period of time. Now, if you'd been around then, it might have been tempting to say life was much nicer out on the farm in Vandalia, where we, everybody knew everybody else, and, you, and, you, and so everybody back to the farm, please. But that's not what we did, what, or what our predecessors did. They invented new ways of connecting that fit the way we had come to live in cities, but that nevertheless allowed us to reconnect. And so I see our problem today in a certain sense, I don't want to be misunderstood here, in a certain sense we've got to reinvent the, reinvent the Rotary Club. I don't mean that organization or reinvent the NAACP. I don't mean those as organizations. I mean we need to be as creative as people were 100 years ago who invented those new ways of connecting. From my own view, I think there are some things we know that would work. Part of the story here is to try to create a new civic generation among current young people emulating their, their grandparents, who were also very civic. And we know some things would work in our schools. We know, for example, that extracurricular activities work in the sense that kids who are involved in you know, debate or band or chorus or football or basketball or whatever, if they're involved in those extra, extracurricular activities in school, all their lives they're more connected with their communities. They develop habits of teamwork and so on. And yet, in communities all across America in the 70s and 80s, we defunded extracurricular activities. And that was, in my view, dumb. We know that civics works. That is, kids who learn in school as a course about, com about their community and about politics and government and about how their community works and what role they can play in it, 
and even just learning, you know, how many houses of Congress there are, those sorts of skills are a prerequisite to, you know, getting involved. What about adults? Let me begin with what I think is the most important single domain here, and that is uh, resolving the tensions between the structure of our work life and our family and community obligations. You know, we've been through a major change in America, really a revolutionary change, in terms of the way work fits into our lives over, over our adult lifetime. Between 1965 and the year 2000, about a third of all Americans moved from kitchens to offices. And yet we still think of work the way we did when two career families were not typical. We still think of the sort of ideal worker as somebody who's got someone else, or got a wife at home. But most of us don't have wives at home anymore. And, and I'm not suggesting we should. I'm not suggesting that should be reversed. But we've got to think differently about the role of work in our lives. What are the exciting ideas? Often newcomers to a town have a tough time getting connected. Now, when you know, we had uh, this ha the, the structure of our families was that there was a wife at home and a husband going out working, welcome wagon made sense in which the, you know, somebody came around and, and spoke to your, your, your housewife or your mom uh, when you just moved to town. But we don't live that way anymore. S we live, however, in an internet generation. And so there's a group in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, that is using an internet website as a basis for connecting people who've just moved to Minneapolis, St. Paul. And then it's not just a purely virtual community. I'm a little skeptical about purely virtual communities. But they use this to develop face-to-face -face connections. So they get together and some, some weekend they'll have a, 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 you know, learning what are the new restaurants in, in or what are the restaurants that we want to go to here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. So I think around the country there are some signs. Now you don't know which of these is going to turn out to be the Boy Scouts for the 21st century. I mean, it's the idea that really clicks. but. But I'm optimistic, actually, we're going to be able to solve this problem if we put our minds to it. On Thursday morning, Greater Cincinnati Foundation released the results of a major survey about the state of social capital in our community. After the break, I'll be joined by Catherine Merchant, the president of the Greater Cincinnati Foundation, about their effort to strengthen social capital. Welcome back. Over the past six months, Robert Putnam has been attempting to assess the state of social capital in cities across the nation. One of those cities is Cincinnati. Locally, that process has been sponsored and coordinated by the Greater Cincinnati Foundation. I am joined this morning by Catherine Merchant, the president and CEO of the Greater Cincinnati Foundation, to discuss that study and what we might do locally to enhance social capital. Welcome back to Newsmakers. Thanks, Dan. It's good to be here. Why um, Greater Cincinnati Foundation? Why did you get involved I in working with uh, Putnam on this particular effort? And you did this massive survey that was just released uh, on Thursday. What, why, why did GCF do this? Well, we think that this is, in essence, what the foundation stands for. This is really our mission. Uh, Bob talked about charitable giving and volunteering. He didn't really touch on grant making, but that's part of our role in this community. And so we feel that really this is what we're all about. And we were delighted to be able to participate in the study. Last time you were here, uh, and I don't know exactly, 10 months ago or so, you were here talking about a project that you're sponsoring in several Cincinnati neighborhoods, Price Hill, uh, Northside, and East Walnut Wall Hills, Walnut Hill, right. Walnut Hills. Um, is that related? Is it that is. one of the kind of, pro just a quick capsule of what that is, and is that related to Putnam, and did it grow out of Putnam's work? Ashley, we're happy to tell you that we are so bought into the concept of social capital that we thought this up before we even had met Bob Putnam and had learned uh, the phrase social capital. Um, call it dumb, dumb luck, but um, one of the central features of Community Investment Partners, which is the name of this initiative, is the notion that in order for a neighborhood to be strong and vibrant, the people who live there have to be connected to each other. They have to have uh, a, a part in planning for the neighborhood's future and actually working on the things that make it healthy and vital. And that really is a perfect example of what Bob is trying to help us understand that social capital means. So uh, we have other examples of that as well over the years. You know, I think you're saying that you were doing <coughs> this before you had 
heard the term social capital. And I think that's one of the things about really important books is they capture something that everybody kind of feels yes. and they give a name to it, social capital, or they capture an image. Bowling alone is just a great <laughs> image. A and when he metaphor. first used this about six years ago, I mean, it just set everybody. I mean, everybody was talking about the article long before the book came out. Yes. Um, let's talk a little bit about the results of this survey. Okay. And you worked on this survey with the University of Cincinnati Institute of Policy Research with Al Tukfarber. That's right. Which everybody knows, and uh, who everybody knows. And what is it that came out of this survey of our metropolitan region compared to the nation as a whole, the 40 other communities that Putnam's working with? Well, I'd like to start with the backdrop message that Bob gives us, which is that social capital has declined in America pretty substantially since the 60s. Our study, our survey, captures our social capital here today at this moment in time. So it doesn't measure the past, but it gives us a way to understand today. It's a snapshot. Today. It's a snapshot. So the results have been normed. If Al were here, he could do a better explanation than I can. But it's a, it's a way to equalize the results to show us so we can hinge our results on, on that norm. But the norm itself, we should understand, is not good news because it captures the decline at this moment in time. What we see in Cincinnati is that uh, out of 11 measures of social capital, we are above average on uh, six or seven of them. I think you're going to slow a sh show a slide. Yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> let's pull, pull up our up. Uh, a slide here, the, uh, the still store. And here it is. And we had to edit this down to fit it on our screen. Mm -hmm. So I, only, I don't have all of the categories. But 100 is the norm, is the national norm. Correct. What, what the point you're making is 100 is where America is today. That's right. That's not necessarily better. In fact, it's probably a lot worse That's than right. it was 35 Precisely. years ago. But Cincinnati exceeds the norm mm -hmm. on the thing on the factors on the top, like exactly. social capital e equality, associational involvement, giving and volunteering. Those are up. But then we do have some areas that we fall below the social capital areas. Is that right. correct? And it's important to understand on this graph that the uh, blue slides on the edge um, indicate where a statistical significance would begin. So you can see that we don't quite reach those blue bars. These are important but not statistically significant Which results. Which means that we're pretty much in the norm. We are. What's happening we're in Cincinnati is not that different than what's happening anyplace else That's in right. any of these categories. That's right. We're like the, the national point. average. Let's take a look at some of those uh, factors. Uh, one of the areas that we were weak on mm -hmm. was conventional politics. And people might have noticed that since people who watch this show pay attention to politics, thankfully. Um, one of the things that Al mentioned in the press conference on last Thursday is that we really fell down on that because of one answer to one particular question. Right. right? We don't know the names of our U.S. senators. <laughs> Which may seem trivial, but in my right. mind, I think it reinforces the view that Cincinnati doesn't think of itself as part of Ohio. We think of ourselves as, as some sort of city-state uh, unconnected because we don't report on what goes on right. in Columbus and so on one hand that may not be too important but on the other hand it may indicate something well if Al were here, here he could also tell you that our nation does not do well on this measure either uh, of all the cities surveyed only 17 percent could name their US senators and in Cincinnati that percentage was 7 percent it skews the statistic a little more than it should, I think is what Al would have us understand. But there's work to do, uh, I think, generally, in making sure that we exercise our rights and responsibilities as uh, citizens of this country to be involved in the political process. And that is one of Bob Putnam's big messages. Well, I think one of the things that Bob Putnam said on the interview that we heard in the first half of the show is that for in schools, we need civics as education. Yes. I would only say we need to do that with adults. I mean, it's not just children who need to, to grapple with these. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it's more important that adults uh, grapple with that sort of thing. Let's take a look at another category, okay. and that's the area of diversity. Mm -hmm. um, in the results of the survey, Cincinnati was pretty much in the norm yes. in terms of racial diversity and acceptance, tolerance, except I gotta ask, does that really ring true to you given what's happening with police community relations, given the results of other surveys that say that we are uh, one of the top most segregated communities, looking at the metropolitan area now, most segregated communities in the United States. I, I don't, that didn't, that surprised me. That figure surprised me and it doesn't ring really true to me. Well, I'm not sure uh, how to evaluate uh, your question, but what the survey results suggest to me 
is that the people who live here, um, at least in their minds and in their hearts, have expressed a level of tolerance for diversity that we need to find a way to tap into. So I'd rather sort of take that and look toward the future and see how we can build some bridges uh, among people where they may have differences, uh, different points of view, and help find that common ground. Again, that is uh, in part what we think our mission is as a community foundation, and we're willing to step up to the plate to help work on that. You know, in talking about the way people join groups or yes. don't join groups, uh, Putnam talks about two different kinds of groups. Some are the, the groups that we join because we all like each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we all belong to the same church. We all are Irish Catholics or whatever the heck we are. Uh, those are bonding groups. Correct. There's another type of group, another type of effort called what he refers to as bridging. That's right. How does that relate and how does that relate to the future of what GCF wants to do? Well, one of the things that Bob uh, encourages all to do is to figure out the new civic innovation for the future. Invent the new kinds of, I don't know if he means organizations, but new ways, new structures for people to build those bridges, to find their common ground. And I can't tell you exactly any more than Bob Putnam can what that ought to look like, but that's what I think we should be working on. And again, I, I think that you will see us do some thinking about that in the coming months and uh, more to come on that later. Yeah, because those are the tough ones. They are the tough ones. Those are the tough ones, but therefore the most important. I'd like to just raise one more challenging thing. Okay. One of the things we, we came out best on was civic leadership. And I yes. think Cincinnati takes a lot of pride in leadership in this community. Right, I just, so. to, I just want to raise a point though. One of the issues that's being talked about in, again in other studies like the Metropolitan Growth Alliance yes. and uh, the Gallus Report and some others that have, have come out is the problem of fragmentation of the metropolitan area. That, that we don't work together as a region very well. This is not new. I mean, I just ran across a film that's 50 years old that I used on Newsmakers two <laughs> weeks ago that talked about exactly, exactly the same, same thing. thing. If we have such great leadership, how come we haven't coped with these fundamental problems of metropolitan structure? Is it, are, I, my raise this question only, are we complacent here? Do we push our leaders? Do we really have leaders or does it just look like we have leaders? Well, I know the argument of complacency is a strong one here. I hear that often myself as a relative newcomer. I cannot comment on that over time. But as you know, part of the purpose of the Metropolitan Growth Alliance is to try to forge new bridging relationships among people who live throughout our very large region. It's eight counties and three states, um, gaining on two million people. And uh, it's as big, practically, as the state of Connecticut, where I lived before I came here. It's huge. So it's difficult to, to, to know everyone and to make the relationships, to build the trust, the reciprocity, the mutual respect, and the networks, that, which are the ingredients of social capital, so that you could have the kind of ties that would actually strengthen our region for the future. But we're working on that and, and making some progress. And Greater Cincinnati Foundation has a real stake in Metropolitan Growth Alliance. Indeed. And in fact, your offices are in the same building. Indeed. I'm very aware of time, so I want to keep moving here. Another one of Putnam's interesting points to me was the impact of sprawl and mm -hmm. commuting. And the, every 10 minutes extra of commuting, 10% less of involvement in the community. One of the concrete issues in our community right now is light rail mass transit. Yes. What does that say about what Greater Cincinnati Foundation or other organizations ought to be doing about taking that issue seriously? Will you lobby for that? I, we are not a lobbyist, so I can't say that we would lobby for anything. Um, I think that it's important for our community to look at alternative ways for people to move from where they live to where they work. I mean, for the basic economics of the situation, for starters. And uh, I don't have a position on a particular form of public transportation, but I think anything that would um, eliminate individuals riding in their cars alone, both for the environmental reasons as well as now the social capital reasons, so that they wouldn't be alone, they'd have someone to talk to and could maybe gain back some of that 10% of their time that they're losing would be important to look at. I want to make clear we're almost out of time that there is Greater Cincinnati Foundation has organized a new group called Better Together Cincinnati Task Force. And we have a list of uh, the groups that are on there, Cincinnati Business Committee, Cincinnati Action Agency, Community Chess, the Urban League, the Chamber, Cincinnati Fine Arts Institute. Is this the forum, is this the new forum that's going to, to try to respond to Putnam and this study? Yes, it is. Um, these uh, organizations helped us co-sponsor Bob's visit to Cincinnati last October. 
and each of us uh, has a reason to care about the strength of social capital in our community. Collectively, we, we represent the leadership organizations from the beginning and the end of the 20th century, and so now the challenge is, can we find ways to lead in the 21st? Thank you for being here, Kathy. Thank you for having this me. This is a great work. It's very important. Come back. Thank you. We'll six months. You give us six okay, months. Okay, give me six months. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the women and the men shaping our community for the future. Mm -hmm.